There's a museum in West Yorkshire where you can walk around an Elizabethan manor and see exactly for yourself what it was like to live as a fairly wealthy family in the 1600s. There's staff members who can answer your questions, there's all of the furniture that you would expect to see there in a house of the time, and there may even be the chance to catch a glimpse of one of the original owners of the house. But if you see this pale man walking past right in front of you before disappearing up into the painted chamber, don't be offended if he doesn't even acknowledge you. It's not that he's rude, or thinks that he's too good to engage in conversation with you, it's because he is long dead and you have just seen a ghost. So it's 1583, Queen Elizabeth sits on the throne, William Shakespeare, he's just had his first kid, and a man called John Batt has just finished constructing his new family home in Oakwell, which was like a little farming community in West Yorkshire. And I say was because it seems like the village of Oakwell kind of merged in and became Burstall. And so John Batt, he came from old money, even in the 1500s. His family had always been entrepreneurial and they'd worked their way up to relative wealth from business deals in Halifax over the last few hundred years. Toiling in a field was not the play for the bats, do not blame them. But they'd really committed to the kind of get rich at all costs mindset because apparently some of John's relatives in previous generations had been involved in a plot to steal the church bell and melt it down and also to demolish the rectory to sell on the stones. They'd even apparently basically embezzled money that was supposed to be used to build a school and had just pocketed it themselves. But it seems like John, he was a fairly stand-up guy as far as we know, there are no plots to steal the clothes off the vicar's back or anything. And so this place that he had built, Oakwell Hall, it was obviously an indication of the family's wealth at the time. It wasn't obnoxiously over the top because the bats weren't like the uppermost upper class, but they were still just like pretty well off. It was built with these two wings coming off a great hall, which was obviously very impressive to anyone visiting the house. And so the bats lived happily in this newly built house, John's son Robert took it on, and then Robert son John, very confusing, he then took over as head of the household. And this John Bat, the original John Bat's grandson, he was a justice of the peace, which was a pretty prestigious title at the time. It was unpaid, but you would have had to have been like handpicked by the queen. So it was a pretty big deal. Would do wonders for your reputation kind of thing. And so John Bat would have been in charge of things like collecting taxes, sorting out road repairs, and even presiding over criminal cases in the area. And then in his spare time, he'd be rubbing shoulders with the gentry, hunting, socialising and just overall trying to get in with the right crowd and elevate his status. And as he was clawing his way up the social hierarchy, he would be improving Oakwell Hall to keep up with his rising reputation. You gotta have a hall befitting the kind of man that you are at the time kind of thing. It's all very much keeping up with the Joneses, it's all about the optics. However, we are now getting into the mid 1600s and so it is all about to kick off because King Charles I is now on the throne and Parliament isn't happy about about how he's running things. And so begins the English Civil War. And John Batt, he's a royalist. He's on King Charlie's side. There was quite a big battle that took place not too far away from Oakwell Hall, the Battle of Edwalton Moor in June 1643. And obviously a man of his standing, of course, John Batt was there fighting as a captain on the royalist side. And they actually won this battle. They sent the parliamentarians retreating. But while they won that battle, they most definitely did not win the war. King Charles was executed. Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protector of the English, Scottish and Irish Commonwealth because obviously he couldn't declare himself king after fighting the crown. And John Batt, the royalist, was fined one tenth of the value of his estate for basically being a sympathizer for the wrong side, which came to about 365 pounds, which is roughly around 57 grand in today's money. Which I mean, at least they weren't executed for being traitors or anything like that, right? But that was still a lot of money and it wasn't just like they had that kind of money hanging around in like liquid currency. It was on the value of his estate, not the money in his bank. So he appealed to parliament, but I don't think they were feeling very forgiving, what with the whole civil war and everything, so he had to pay. He tried setting up like new income streams, trying to come up with the money. And this could have been the reason that he actually sailed to Virginia with three of his sons, trying to set up this business of providing transport to settlers who wanted a new life in the new world. While this didn't work out for him either, there was apparently a super nasty dispute over money with his business partner, so he didn't make the money that he needed. And his eldest son actually fell overboard on the way home and drowned, so 
it just wasn't a great time all round. Apparently the bats were able to gather up the money, but their wealth never really recovered after it. But they say living in the house and it kept passing through the family until it reached the final John Bat, who died without any children to pass it on to in 1707. 40 years later, in 1747, some of the Oakwell estate was sold on. I'm guessing maybe like that 40 years, John's widow carried on living in the house after his death or something. But when it was sold, a guy called Benjamin Fernley bought it. And he was a lawyer, so not making a small amount of money, but in reality, he really couldn't afford this house. Didn't matter though, he was gonna find a way. He wanted this place. Thing was, they were still paying it off after he'd died, and his son Fairfax was not as obsessed with this house as his father was, and the debt was just too much to realistically deal with, so he sold Oakwell on again in 1789. It was taken on by landlords who rented it out to tenants, and then a series of boarding schools rented it in the 19th century. And so by the 1840s, it was running as a boarding school for girls. This is when Charlotte Bronte, you know, one of the Bronte sisters who wrote Jane Eyre, she visited Oakwell when it was a girls' school because one of her closest friends from when she was a kid, Ellen Nussie, she lived in Burstall, and it was Ellen's cousin who was running the school. It must have made a pretty lasting impression on her as Oakwell became the inspiration for Fieldhead, which was an estate where some of her novel Shirley was set. Bit of a claim to fame. And so while it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination a grand house like other houses of the time, to give you an example like Longleat House or my personal favourite, Bruce Wayne's pad in Dark Knight Rises, Wollerton Hall, it was still large enough to comfortably house all of like these different boarding schools and whatnot. In 1926, the landlords that owned it at the time decided that they'd had enough of it. And there were actually rumours that it was going to be taken apart brick by brick and shipped off to America, but it didn't, clearly. In 1928, two wealthy men, Sir Henry Norman and Ray and John Earl Sharman, they bought the house for £2,500 and gave it to Batley Corporation, which was basically like what is now the local council. And then in the 1970s, the rest of the estate was also bought and became a country park. In 1988, the voluntary group Friends of Oakwell Hall and Country Park was established and they help with like the upkeep of the house and the grounds. And so if you go and visit today, it's set up like a living museum. It's decked out with how it would have looked in the 1600s when the Bat family would have been living there. Because obviously like the Fernleys who bought it off the bats, they were under this mountain of debt from buying the place. And then the subsequent tenants aren't exactly going to go spending money on improving a house that they didn't even own. So the building remains pretty much the same as it was when the bats owned it. Like you can be walking through there and feeling like at any moment one of the bats could come just striding through the door. Which is apparently what's happened, according to one of the most famous ghost stories out of that place. So now I've just brought you up to the modern day, but we're going to go back again to the 9th of December 1684, because Oakwell Hall's ghost story actually starts when the bats were still living in the place. So in 1684, it was now, you know John the Royalist, his son, he had died, but his widow Elizabeth was still living in the house, and their 25-year-old son William was living there too, and I think some other family members. So on this night in December, William Bat had actually gone down to London on business, leaving Elizabeth, his mother, and the rest of the family at Oakwell. They were there just doing whatever a moderately wealthy family in the evening would do, and there was a banging at the door. The servant went to the front door to see who it could be at this hour kind of thing, when Captain William Bat, the son that was supposed to be in London, came striding in. Which was weird in itself, because William, he wasn't supposed to be back yet, but he came marching through the house, pale as anything, refused to acknowledge anyone. Obviously they were there asking like, are you alright? What's happened? Why you home early, wouldn't say a word, just carried on walking through the house to his bedroom. The family decided to follow him into the bedroom, see if they could like get some answers out of him. So they walked in to find a completely empty room. William wasn't in there. What was in there was a single bloody footprint. Now this was very weird. The whole family had seen William walk through the house. I mean, even the servant had opened the door to let the guy in. Where could he have gone? He was not in that room. And I don't even know how you would begin to try and explain that one away amongst yourselves, but they must have done as they carried on with their lives. Like, we've all just had a collective hallucination about William, who must still be in London or something. Or maybe he's hiding in the walls, living a secret life. Who knows? It's not like you could give him a ring on his phone, see what he's up to and like check in on him, can you? Can't do find my friends or whatever. So you kind of just have to wait and see what happens. 
Anyway, a few days later, the family is visited by a messenger from London. The messenger tells them that Captain William Bat had died in a duel. In the afternoon of the exact night when all the family had seen him walk through the house to his bedroom. He'd been drinking in the Black Swan Inn in Holborn and had borrowed some money, presumably from a guy called Mr. Green. And I say presumably because a diarist, so like someone who wrote a diary way back then, said that Captain William Bat was killed in sport and he said he was slain by Mr. Green. But apparently this guy was a bit gossipy, so the details might be a bit murky. Either way, freaky, right? William's body was brought back home and he was buried in Burstall. And so unsurprisingly now, the bedroom that this figure of William disappeared in, the painted chamber, is now supposed to be the most haunted room in the entire house. Apparently loads of people have witnessed dark shadows like flitting about the bedroom, and some have even claimed to see the solid figure of William himself walking towards that bedroom. Which is just an absolutely wild story. The rest of this activity has come from mainly most haunted, just so you're aware and you can make your own mind up, but there have been some other pretty weird reports. So you'll be in that room, in the painted chamber, all of a sudden it will just fill with the smell of tobacco smoke for absolutely no reason. Like if you were blindfolded, you could be forgiven for thinking that a smoker was in there with you lighting up a pipe, like the smell is that strong. But of course you'd be in the room alone, and then as quickly as the tobacco smell appears, it disappears again. So I don't know if any of the owners or tenants or anything used to smoke, I'm gonna assume that they did, but who specifically this smell is connected to, I don't know. There's another room that's worth mentioning and it's like a little study room off the balcony that kind of overlooks the Great Hall. And this would have been one of the rooms where Robert Bat, so John the Royalist's dad, William's great granddad, would have stored his huge collection of like books and maps and things. Because Robert Bat, he was quite the scholar, I think he went to university too. Apparently this room quite often experiences poltergeist activity. The shelves will be dismantled or like pulled apart and the objects on the shelves will be just like thrown across the room. There's also been reports of people seeing dark shadows walking along the balcony itself, just like staff and family probably would have done in life, which they apparently still appear to be doing afterwards too. In 1987, an employee of the museum claimed that she saw a woman wearing a Tudor dress just stood by a window looking out of it for a few minutes before disappearing. Children have also been seen near the staircase, or sometimes you'll just like hear kids playing in that area. And witnesses have also seen kids in like 1800s clothing playing in the rear garden. They apparently ran off into a dead end part of the garden where they just completely vanished. Like there was nowhere for them to go, but they were nowhere to be seen. Which I mean, it was a family home for hundreds of years. I would have had lots of kids growing up there. But then of course it was a boarding school for many years after that. Like there would have been so many kids like running and playing in the halls and outside in the garden. It would have been interesting to find out more about these boarding schools, any bits of history like worth mentioning from them, but I didn't really find anything. So if you know anything about the schools themselves or anything at all about the house, please do comment it down below. There was also an interview done on Most Haunted and the guy was saying that he was locking up around 10 o'clock at night, no one else around. All of a sudden he started hearing this banging noise, like someone really loudly knocking on the door or like hammering on a piece of wood or something. Obviously it initially freaked him out, like being alone in this old house at 10 o'clock at night and hearing something so loud like that. But then his first rational thought was maybe it was workmen coming to fix a broken window that they must have had at the time. Which I appreciate the dedication to finding a rational explanation, like I gotta give it to you for that. But workmen at 10 o'clock at night doesn't really sound super logical. And that was confirmed when he went and did a walk all around the inside and outside of the house. There wasn't a single living soul around the place and presumably he never found the source of that really loud knocking noise. And then something else that's reported, you know how sometimes you get rooms in haunted places where animals might freak out, like dogs refusing to go into a certain room and things like that? Well, Oakwell Hall has a few of these rooms that for reasons they don't even know themselves, humans also get those feelings. Like the new parlor room, one of the bedrooms that they've got set up in the museum, some people will just get to the threshold and point blank refuse to walk in there, but then they can't give you an actual explanation as to why. And then there's one more phenomenon that's been claimed on the house grounds themselves. And it's that Oakwell Hall has its own devil dog or shook dog. And in folklore, basically it's a big black dog with glowing eyes. This one at Oakwell apparently has glowing breath as well. They can apparently be as big as seven foot long, like absolutely huge things. I'm gonna imagine that's pretty creepy to see, like huge great big dog, completely black with glowing eyes and mouth. And usually they're an omen that you or someone very close to you is about to die. Not something you wanna see on your after dinner stroll. 
But unless I'm missing something, I can't find any other reference to this devil dog other than what Most Haunted said. So alarm bells are ringing already, you know? But then what gets me about this story is that calling it a shuck dog or a black shuck is more of the East Anglian version of this like folklore tale. But where Oakwell Hall sits in Yorkshire, they actually have their own version of this very same phenomenon and it's called a guy trash and again was an omen of death. Weird circle back, Charlotte Bronte also mentioned the guy trash in her novel Jane Eyre, the more you know. So there's that that makes me a little bit, I'm not 100% sure on that story. But phantom dogs that may or may not have been claimed aside, one story that hasn't come from Most Haunted is that the road that leads up to Oakwell Hall is also apparently haunted as well. It's called Warren's Lane, but back in the day was actually called Bloody Lane. And that's because during that Civil War battle that John Bat fought in, where the Royalists won, it's more than likely that the parliamentarian soldiers that would have made it out of the bloodbath alive would have retreated along that road. Obviously battered, bloody, some maybe even half dead. And so now some witnesses have claimed to have seen these parliamentarian soldiers walking along that lane. And so while the house and grounds are like bustling with life in the day, all of these visitors learning about the history of this centuries old hall, once everyone's gone home and the building is in darkness again, the true owners of this estate may return to their once beloved family home. So what do you think? I'd probably have never heard of this story unless it was requested to me. It was like in none of my paranormal books. There aren't really any podcasts or anything on the history. Obviously we've got everyone's favorite Most Haunted that covered it in 2015, but other than that, there aren't really any paranormal investigations like on YouTube or anything like that, which usually makes me lean towards the fact that maybe the museum doesn't want the attention of the paranormal community. But that doesn't seem to be the case here, I don't think. Like they have the whole ghost story of William Bat on their website. So maybe if paranormal teams wanna go check that one out, it might be a good shout for a location. Either way, I was so glad to be able to cover this one because it is such an interesting place. And it's got that type of story that just always really intrigues me. That all the family members saw this solid figure of William on the day he died almost 200 miles away. And for even the servant to be answering a banging on the door. Like this wasn't just a figure walking through the walls kind of thing. But yeah, of course, there's the possibility that it is all just a made up legend. Like it could have started with William's mom obviously getting the news that her son had died a few days later. And she just goes like, oh, I knew I had a bad feeling around that time. Like I knew he shouldn't have gone to London or whatever. And then it's just snowballed from there into this whole story. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I mean, look at how old the place is. It's a big stone building set up almost exactly how it would have been in the 1600s. It's like the perfect ingredient list for a residual haunting recipe. Was that a good analogy? Oh God, I don't know. I don't just go with it right when I'm next up that way I'm absolutely adding this to the list of places that I want to visit I'm gonna need to write a book with like all of these different places like a don't scare Claire AA road atlas book to all of these haunted places that I keep talking about because there's a lot you should see my content schedule honestly but I am always open to requests tell me your most interesting paranormal story that you've heard and I'll look into it and possibly cover it on this channel but anyway that is all from me today I cannot wait to chat with you more about the morbid mysterious and macabre so until next time, sleep safe. I need to get a new chair. This chair is the main character of this whole YouTube channel. Let's be honest. Damn it.